Hi, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about wiring VFDs. Now this came about because I had a comment from a viewer um, and also something John on John's workshop said uh, about um, putting his VFD in a box. Um, now the, the viewer comment was about the VFD I fitted to my pillar drop. Um, basically saying it's not safe, you need to put it in a box um, and you must take your video down straight away. Um, needless to say, I haven't taken my video down because I don't think there's a explicit problem, although I did pin the comment so that his concerns were visible to others. Um, but let me just show you what this looks like um, and why I don't think it's a big issue, but there are a couple of things I will do to improve it. So to begin with, all the wiring um, with the VFD is right at the back way way beyond where you're ever going to put your hand um, all the controls that I use are here on the front um, this box is earthed this has got the mains coming into it um, it's isolated by the emergency stop um, this start and stop are low voltage and they go off to the VFD so number one all the wiring is out the way it's not in an enclosure but for me that's fine all right so this is the back of the uh, unit this um, VFD fits very nicely in this um, casting now I suspect what the uh, viewer was upset about was the fact that we've got these um, terminals here um, and potentially single insulated wires just at the very end there um, on both the mains input and the motor output now again because this is back at, at the back of the machine I'm never going to touch it um, but there are a couple of things we could do just to make this a little better so yes I mean I could buy a metal box um, and put it in a metal box um, and then put holes in it and a fan to keep it cool because it's gonna get hot um, but I just don't think that's necessary these contacts this this slot is eight millimeters um, now IP2 X um, from the ingress protection scale the aperture has to be less than 12 and a half millimeters or half an inch so that you can't get your finger in there now this is eight millimeters so it's technically ip2 so you could say that that is probably sufficient um, but i could if i tried really hard i could probably get a just about get a finger on one of those terminals quite difficult but it could be done so quick and dirty I can shove a grommet in the hole and then there is no access to those contacts and I can do the same down here so what else can we do to improve this well uh, as I said we've got single insulation from the end of the uh, outer there down to the um, ferrules that the wires crimped into um, so I could add some heat shrink on here um, which goes over the ferrule body as well and then that will be fully double insulated the whole way to the terminal uh, and finally there's no strain relief on that cable which fair enough that could probably be done and all that needs is a is a cable tie um, through one of those vents and that to me would be sufficient now I'm not saying that this is the best way of doing it I'm saying this is the the minimal way of doing it um, obviously putting it in a metal box is absolutely fine um, but I'm just saying it's not necessary so I'm going to put the uh, the heat shrink on the wires and put a cable tie on each end just to strain relief strain relief those wires and that should do So I've left just a little bit showing at the top there so I can see which wire is which. Make sure I get it in the right hole. Okay, so they're now secured. Let's put this piece of heat shrink over the exposed bits.
finally a cable tie. See if I can get this through the hole. I'm back out again. Yep. Alright, so there we are. Now wires are fully double insulated all the way to the connection. The screw terminals are no longer accessible in any way um, other than if you wanted to stick a screwdriver or something in there which of course would be very difficult to do when it's the other way around um, and we strain relief the cable with a with a cable tie so that in my opinion is now totally safe before it was safe enough um, if you were looking at it from a risk assessment point of view like you would do at work um, you do what is the severity and then what is the likelihood so obviously the severity of getting an electric shock could be high um, but the likelihood in my opinion is very low because of all the factors I've already explained um, now the severity is actually relatively low because this workshop is protected by a 30 milliamp RCD um, or GFCI as you call them in America which I feel is sufficient protection Obviously, if you've got a pacemaker or a heart condition or something, it may not suit you. Um, and if this machine went on to somebody else, then that might be less optimal. Um, obviously, now it's in a state where I'd be completely happy for it to go to somebody else. But if you're in a position where you've got a machine and the electrics are in question, they're sort of not original, um, then it is entirely your responsibility to make sure that you are completely happy with the safety of that electrical system. You are responsible for your own safety, um, nobody else. YouTube videos are for information, for guidance, but they're not training videos unless they're explicitly stated as such. Um, you know, all the stuff I do, this is a lash up. Because, well, when I bought this, um, I got this for £22. And I didn't even know if it was going to work for more than five minutes. So I wasn't going to spend ages putting it in a nice box and faffing around and stuff. Only to find five minutes later it blew up. So I've lashed it up. And because it's been out of sight, it's been out of mind for two years or however long it's been. Um, and here we are. But the viewer had a valid point in spirit. Um, just the details I disagree with slightly. Um, so I'm going to um, do the same treatment that I've done up here, uh, down here, on these electrical wires. Um, and that should make this one, in my opinion, safe enough. Now, moving round, I have another VFD. This is my lathe VFD. Now this is exactly the same setup. We've got a, you know... Um, single insulated wires, no strain relief, um, same with the motor out the bottom. Um, but again, this is a lash up. It's temporary because I'm going to be building a new stand for the lathe. And when I do that, the electrics for the VFD and so on will probably go down in this cupboard down here. Now, the reason why they're not in there at the moment is because it's not watertight. And if I'm using coolant, um, it's quite a high likelihood that um, water will get underneath the lathe through the holes and drip down in here um, which in my mind is far more dangerous than some single insulated wires at the back of the lathe um, remember I don't touch these controls the controls for the lathe are here so again it's a it's a risk assessment thing for me it's not an issue um, but equally the way I've installed it isn't the best way to do it it's a way so another thing that came up in the comments was the use of an isolator or a NVR to isolate the power from the VFD now people are saying that if you do that you're possibly going to fry the VFD that may be true of some VFDs 
Um, but these two, at least, both cope perfectly well with power failure. They've got settings in their setup for what to do in the event of a power failure, because they both detect power failure. Um, the lathe one, um, I have a resistor, which I've not yet fitted. Um, that'll be a future video, I expect. Um, but the idea with that is to set the VFD to hard stop the lathe using the resistor in the event of a power failure. Um, I mean, same with the drill. That I don't believe I'll need a resistor for the drill. Um, looking at it from a sort of inertia point of view, a, ch a lathe has got a massive chuck, potentially some work in there, spinning away, which will take a while to spin down. Whereas a drill, on the other hand, has got a lot less rotating mass, um, so therefore any kind of braking is going to generate less um, energy, simply because there's less um, potential energy stored in the rotating mass of the system. That said, I have put a multimeter on the, um, the bus voltage pins on this inverter at least, um, and when you kill the power, the voltage doesn't actually go up. I mean, this is a semi-decent inverter, um, VFD, so it probably handles it very well, but there may be other, other VFDs out there that don't. So it, it's, a, it's a possibly valid um, argument. Um, however, I think the, it may stem from um, disconnecting the load during operation, um, which is quite different. And in fact, both of the manuals for these two VFDs do explicitly specify to not disconnect the load from the VFD while it's running. Not recommended. That's not what's happening here. So stick with isolating the power at the mains input end. Well, I hope that answered a few questions and clarified a few things. Uh, John, if you're watching and if it applies in any way to your situation, um, yeah, the, the way you've set up your inverter on the wall, back of your machine, my opinion is perfectly fine. Um, obviously, putting in the strain relief for the cables is probably the most important bit. Adding a bit of insulation over those very short exposed single insulated bits um, helps. But it's, it's all about risk management, essentially. As long as you're happy with the risks that it poses to yourself and anyone else who uses your workshop, that's fine. My videos are very much a uh, this is what I did kind of thing, not a this is how you should do it. That uh, drill VFD video was focused on how to connect it up and how to set it up to get it working, not on how to do a um, professional grade installation All right so some of you may have noticed that i've not been very productive over the past couple of months um variety of reasons past couple of weeks i have been knee deep in a new diy project i'll put some photos up now um i am doing a new patio outside the back of our house which involved digging a trench from um, my shed down to the house um, because I wanted to put in a conduit and some new power feed cable because the power cable running to the shed at the moment is just about rated to what I, I use but with things like the um, the air source heat pump and the um, burnout kiln there's just a lot more watts going around uh, in the workshop than there were when I originally had it installed so I've put in a bigger cable that's yet to be connected um, but I wanted to get that in before I dug up the ground or before I laid a new patio over the ground. So I wanted to dig that up, get the new cable in um, and then do the patio on top. So um, I hired a, uh, a little mini digger to help me with that. Um, and they, they've they uh, painted it in John's workshop orange. Um, it seems to be turning into a bit of a John's workshop um, video, this one. And just so happens that he sent me a sticker. Um, now, quite incredibly, this sticker turned up in less than 18 months. Um, so, yeah, thanks, John. 
Find somewhere to put it on the board, I think. I've got a dirty bit there, so I'll stick John's sticker over that. And also, he's next to my little thousand subscriber thing. Um, I think I probably had about 100 subscribers when I sent my sticker to John. Um, and now I've got a thousand, so it will just um, gently remind him every time um, he sees my sticker board that you know it took a while. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching.